Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the program on Radio.com on this, the 19th day of the month of March. Um, and quite interestingly, the first day of spring. Now, the first day of spring for my whole lifetime has been on the 20th of March. I know that because the 20th of March uh, is my birthday, as some of you know. Um, and in our lifetimes, the vernal equinox, as the spring coming to the northern hemisphere is called, uh, has always happened on the 20th of March. There has been a couple of times where it actually happened late at night on the 20th, almost into the 21st, but it has happened on the 20th. This is the first time in 124 years that, last first time since 1896, that the vernal equinox has happened a day early on the 19th day of March. So we have actually gotten into spring earlier than at any time in the last 124 years in this very strange 2020 that we are already uh, living in. So happy uh, spring to everybody. And I'm sure that for the rest of your lives, you will recount this as being the strangest late winter and the weirdest spring that you have ever encountered. Uh, it is a spring unlike any other that you will ever encounter. Uh, for me tomorrow, it'll be a birthday that I encounter. Uh, that'll be the strangest that I have encountered uh, in my uh, lifetime. Uh, usually it's in the midst of the NCAA tournament, which it would be right now. Um, it's supposed to be a nice day tomorrow, so I hope to get outside and hit a couple of golf balls on my birthday before I spend the late part of the afternoon with you guys. Uh, we'll have a Scott Pioli, who was longtime Patriot and Belichick uh, uh, executive who worked for Belichick, who was very, very close to Tom Brady. If somebody could talk about both people and have a right to talk about both people, there's nobody more qualified to talk about both people than Scott. That's why I'll have Scott on in a couple minutes to talk about both people. I'm trying to find Jay Wright, too, to just see what a team's doing now that they don't have the tournament this year and what team has been more emblematic over the last decade of the madness of March than Villanova, which is a two-time champion in recent years and has been a fixture as a one or a two seed in the NCAA tournament for years. Uh, we're trying to track Jay down. I just thought of that a couple minutes ago, so we might not get to him today. But we will have Scott in a couple of minutes. I want to begin the day where I've begun most recent days because I, for one, am still, as New York has become the epicenter of this, has more cases than anybody in the country, I, for one, am still not feeling like we are making any real progress. And I can't stress this, I cannot stress this strongly enough. Number one, take this seriously. Practice what they're asking you to practice. Don't go having, don't go partying. Don't go getting around groups. Stay home if you can. Tr please treat this seriously. This is serious. It's extremely serious. And we have to do it in a timely fashion. Otherwise, our economy is going to go bust. And I have been, as you know, a supporter of the president. I voted for him. I've been a supporter of his, but I do not feel he and his group have done what they need to do in this instance. I think they need to call the military up. I think they need to use every resource of the national government and treat this like they would a flood, treat this like they would a hurricane, treat this like they would a uh, anything that would happen, a national disaster, an earthquake, whatever you want to use. Put the boots on the ground now and treat this as if every moment is against a race against the clock, because it is. To get people tested, to get people separated, to get the people who are sick into hospitals or into their homes and get the other people back to work. And we are not utilizing what we need to utilize. They should have called up the military days ago and the National Guard and FEMA and utilize every, every inch and every pound and every ounce of manpower. They are great at handling these kind of situations. They are organized. They understand health issues. They understand organization. They can be involved in testing. And we have got to get testing almost door to door, town to town, state to state in this country. Otherwise, we are going to have a colossal crisis of a health issue and a colossal economic crisis, the likes of which we have never even dreamed about. 
And I am not a person who's an alarmist in any way. I think I'm as practical as anybody can be. But I'm telling you, you can't shut this country down this way for a long period of time. We need to get people tested, find out who has the virus and who doesn't, who needs care and who doesn't, escalate this, get people tested. We're not tested on any real level. You know, I've tested 20,000 people in the state of New York. you got to be kidding me. It's ridiculous. you got 5 million people living on Long Island alone. I mean, that's crazy. And the numbers are going up by the thousands a day. Wait till they do serious testing. And you don't want to have these hospitals overflowing and people in the streets. Take this seriously. Get the military involved. Get them to the states where there is huge breakouts of this, whether it's California, Washington, New York. Get people tested. Get testing set up. Get mobile testing get up. Put people, put in, get people in their cars and get them tested. So you get the people home who need to be home. Get the people who, and I just saw Sean Payton tested positive. Get the people who are, are sick. Get them home and get them quarantined, and let the other people who are healthy get away from the people who are sick, let the people who are sick get the care they need, and let's get everybody back to work. I really believe the clock is ticking here. I really believe that we need to get this all done within a reasonable amount of time, or we will have far more people seriously ill and far more people dying than we need to have happen, and we also will have an economy that will not recover for years. And I really think there are portions of this country that are still not taking this seriously. And they're out of their minds. It is going to... It is going to continue to grow enormously quickly and once it gets out of control we won't know what hit us so i just don't understand why you would not use what is an incredible resource in this country treat this like you would put boots on the ground if you had a flood or you had an earthquake or you had raging fires or you had whatever incident you had in a certain state or city and attack the cities that have it the, the states and cities that have it the most work on them first and then react to each state where you start to see a growth in the numbers and that way we can start to get people separated here that's the key and I this to me is just common sense and it's just a leadership void I really think I really think that the government, and I'm not just talking about the White House, I'm talking about Congress too, did not for the first weeks take this seriously enough. They completely dropped the ball on testing. They are way behind in producing tests, but they're not, now that they are starting to produce the tests and they have the factories going, they need to get the tests implemented and use the National Guard. Use the National Guard to clean the hospitals. Use the National Guard to administer the tests. Use the military to do both. And also get people who are it, from health to Red Cross to FEMA to everybody who has expertise in this. Bring in hospital people who might be in other parts of the country where things are slow. And then you'll move them where you have them move them to. You should have a band of two or 3,000 nurses and doctors who are ready to move state to state based on what the need is in that certain state. This should be a mobilization like this is a war. None of this is happening. Listen, I'm not a de Blasio fan. But you know what? What he's calling for here, although I, I, he and Cuomo can fight about whether or not you should shut the city down, I don't know what's realistic. I'd have to see real numbers and see real arguments on both sides before I knew whether it was right to completely shut the city down or not. I'd have to see more. We're now to the point where they say 75% of your workforce should be out of the office. Every, everybody I know has had somebody test positive. The fans had people test positive. Almost everybody I know has had somebody in their office or somebody in their company test positive or knows somebody who's test positive or been in contact with somebody who's test positive already. 
whether in their kids' schools or people I know in different places. I've heard almost from somebody already who knows somebody who tested positive. When do you start finding out that you know somebody, everybody knows somebody who's in the hospital? That'll be next. I mean, you have almost 4,000 positive cases in New York City already. Last week you had, what, 100? You have 4,000 cases just in, you, you know, last week you didn't have 4,000 cases in America. Now you have 4,000 cases in New York City. What happens when you have 250,000 cases in New York City? Or 2 or 3 million cases in New York State? And if 10% of them have got to be in the hospital, we have a huge problem. And again, to me, you hear this stuff, and yes, you want to hear about drugs that can deal with the serious end of this if somebody's attacked. Yes, you do. And I think that's the first thing. They discussed that today. They didn't tell you that there was anything there that was definitive. You heard about a Japanese drug, which the president didn't talk about. That's all over the Internet. You know about the two other drugs, the arthritic drug, the malaria drug, and the arthritis drug from Regeneron and from Gilead. Okay, good. If they can save lives, if people are really sick and they can give you that and they can keep you alive, God bless. That's important. No one wants to think about that they can get die from this. That's if you can alleviate that factor, that's a big one. Because at least people can breathe easy. But we need to quarantine those that are sick, care for those that are sick, and separate the sick from the healthy so that we can get back to living again. You know, we don't have months. They talk about, well, July or August. If you're talking about July, August, and think our economy and these companies in this country can withstand four or five months of this, they can't. We can't bail out every company in this country. There's no way to do that. You're going to bail out every... When we bailed out the banks, it was a big deal. You're going to bail out every company. You're going to bail out every single industry in the United States. What are you going to decide? Which ones fail and which one don't? What about the small businesses that are the backbone of the country? Every one of them is going to fail. Unless they own supermarkets. Or unfortunately, maybe funeral parlors. We have got to do more. I mean, it just seems to me that we should be doing more. All right, when we come back, we'll talk to Scott. Doing great, Mike. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? Good, thank you. How's everybody? Everybody safe? Dallas, uh, family, everybody good? Everyone is safe. Everyone is healthy. I, I appreciate not only just in, the, in our household here in Atlanta, but uh, the entire extended Pioli and Parcells family. Thanks. And how is your family, Mike? Everybody good so far. So the kids are, you know, video conferencing and going to school that way. We're like every other kid <laughs> now. So a new, a new thing. I have an eighth grader and a two- a couple of ninth graders, uh, Jack had his baseball season canceled, unfortunately, which is tough. So, uh, you know, they were just getting ready to start their season. So that's like every other kid in America. So, uh, but it's a crazy, exactly. it's crazy time. Now, as I said, as folks know, who know Scott and they do, who's been a decorated executive of the year countless times in the league and been around the league forever. Nobody is better qualified, folks. And everyone in America has opined on Brady and Belichick, but nobody is more qualified to discuss both of them than Scott is because he is, has been for decades not only work with both of them but infinitely, intimately close with both people. So he understands the dynamics. He's been around the relationship. He understands the Patriots because he was part of their – uh, legendary run for all those years. You know, he started with the Browns with Belichick, went through the Jets, and then went to New England and uh, with Mangini. And I remember the first time meeting those guys when they were young. We were all young. <laughs> it's a long, long time you ago. All had yes, hair then too. absolutely. You did. I still do. But you, you did. As, as a matter of fact. But how surprised were you, honestly? I mean, you. I know you weren't going to give a give an opinion on it as it unfolded. But how, were you surprised? My thought was that Kraft would jump in at the end and play Peacemaker. Were you surprised that they didn't make a deal? You know, Mike, I was a little bit surprised 
from the standpoint, I think my because of my own expectations and hopes, right? I think there were a lot of signals pointing to that it might not work out and that, and that it might not happen. There, again, there were enough signals there. But deep down inside, you know, as we're not supposed to do in this business, because I'm not working in it, I did allow my emotions to get the best of me. And, you know, I'm old school, Mike. You know, I love to see guys, you know, finish their careers in one place, especially when they've been so successful at one place. You know, I go back to remember being devastated when Tom Seaver went from the Mets to the Reds. I'm just, you know, I'm just a sap when it comes to things like that. So I, I wanted to see this thing end a certain way. So, I, again, I think my emotions led me to that. But, you know, Mike, as you and I know, there's this uh, this wise football man who had a great saying one time, and he said, uh, most of the time in this business, rarely will it end the way that you want. And um, that's one of these cases, I think. What do you think Tom wants? I mean, you know Tom from the beginning. You know Tom better than most people in America know him. You know him. You're close to him. Uh, you always have been. What do you think Tom wants? I mean, do you think what do you think is important to him right now? Here's what I think. Well, paramount number one, it's always about his family, right? But when it comes to the game, all he cares about after family is winning and winning football games. And I also think at this point in his career, it, it's it's about respect and wanting to accomplish things that people don't think that he can do. And I think what it really comes back to, Mike, it, this guy has always been about winning. He's one of the most rare individuals I've met, and not just competitors, but just individuals. You know, Mike, I had the good fortune of, of again, being with him his first nine seasons and was around when we did not only his initial contract, but the next two, maybe even three contracts. And every time we got down to business, I was dealing with his agent, Don Yee, who was a terrific guy. Um, and I say he's a terrific guy because he's an agent that truly does what his client wants. He understands that he works for the client, and that's the way he and Tommy had their relationship. But one of the things that always happened is Tommy always intervened and always made sure that he was in charge of his business. And I was there those first couple of times where he was being – you know, significantly underpaid for the amount of success that he was having, the team success, but also for the way he was performing. And he was a guy who always con and consistently left money on the table so he could have more good players around him. And he did that because all he wanted to do was win. And that's just part of his makeup. So, uh, again, I, I just wanted to paint that story because, Mike, that's all he cares about really when it comes to the game is himself performing well for the team so they can win. You think that now you're someone who grew up uh, under Bill Belichick from the beginning. I mean, before you were you, – listen, you were part of his group before he even was a head coach. I mean, you know, he was a head coach, yeah. then he wasn't. You know, you, he brought – he thought enough for you and Mangini to bring you guys and make sure that your father-in-law found a place for you with the Jets. I remember you guys – the day you guys arrived – uh, obviously, you know, that was, it, it showed that he saw stuff in you guys, obviously you and Eric, um, what, what do you think, how tough was this on Belichick or was it just that he knew he couldn't be sentimental? No, you know, here's what it is, Mike. And, and you know, you, you tell the story about mine and Bill's relationship. I mean, I met Bill back in 1985. I want to say it was when I was in college and then, you know, we didn't work together until 1992 and then spent 17 years working together. So I've known him for a long time. I think one of the, 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 there's multiple misperceptions out there about, uh, you know, regarding Bill. And here's what I'll say. You know, he, he, Bill is emotional, right? Bill does have feelings. Bill is um, far more human than, than a lot of people want to give him uh, credit for or, or, or want to understand that he has. What he does, though, is he does an amazing job of separating emotion, feelings, and business. And I don't know what he was feeling through all this. Again, just and, and I'm going to speculate here, knowing um, who he is and what he is, again, behind the multiple curtains that, that he is behind, this, is, this affects him. And it does, because I know he, he not only respects the player, but he cares about the human being, meaning Tommy, and this could not have been easy for him. There's no way that this could be easy for him because I've sat in the room with him when we were a part of letting go of 
other players who had spent even far less time with him. You know, I go back to the Lawyer Malloy thing. You know, when we had to let Lawyer go, Lawyer Malloy go, that that hurt Bill. It bothered him. However, Bill also has this ability to compartmentalize things because he understands the obligation that he has not only to the relationship with the individual, but he has this larger obligation to a greater good, which is all the fans, the owner that's paying him his salary, the other 52 players on a team, the trainers, all the people that depend on Bill making decisions. He maintains his integrity in doing what's best for the greater good, and he puts aside his personal relationships. And some people see that as him being callous or him not being non-feeling, and I think it's actually the the complete opposite, Mike. Scott Pioli was the uh, NFL Executive of the Year on countless occasions, working for the uh, Falcons, working obviously all those years in New England. Uh, Everyone's tried to talk about what could have kept them together. Uh, Like I said, knowing Kraft, I always thought Kraft – and we know how he treated Brady, uh, that he would come in at the end and maybe play peacemaker. Do you think the – you know this, how they work. Do you think they had a number and they just stuck to it and Brady had a number and they just – and he just stuck to it? Or do you think maybe, which could have been the case, even last year they knew that this was over and they never were going to get back together again? Do you think they knew when they parted last year? Or do you think it came down just to economics? Yeah, you know, Mike, I, I honestly don't know. I, I don't know the answer to those questions. But, um, you know, you, you go back to the point that you were making about, you know, Robert and his relationship with with Tommy and, and it very close. And, you know, Robert also had a very, very close relationship with Drew Bledsoe, and he allowed Bill and I to do what we felt was best for the team. And that was going to, you know, continue to make the team successful. And I think, and I can only think of one time in the nine years that I was there um, with Bill and Robert that he ever intervened and told us and suggested strongly. He didn't tell us. He just suggested strongly one player. Um, And again, probably in retrospect, it was something that was emotionally right for our football team. But in this case, this this is this is very difficult. And again, I don't know when Bill made the decision or when Tommy made the decision. Again, I don't know whose final decision this was, but um, you know, the, the fact is here's what we do know. And, Mike, you know both of these people as well. It, with You know Bill Belichick. You know Tom Brady. What they're both going to do is compartmentalize things and say, okay, this is over. Moving forward, here we go, 100 miles an hour. And they won't look back on this and the emotions of this until their careers are done. How hard will it be, Scott, um, knowing the culture there and knowing how Brady, how hard he worked and how, you know, how much of a preparation guy he was and how intense he was about everything. And all great players are. We know that. But there he had the luxury where it was a given that the coach demanded that culture. There was never players unprepared. There were never guys goofing off. There was never any of that stuff. The players were always going to be focused. They were always going to know their roles. They were, he's not, I don't care where he goes. It's not going to be the same. That's not going to, that's not going to exist on that level again, because no one's like the Pats. We understand that. How hard will it be for him to, to deal with that? It'll be difficult for Tommy in that sense. But, but here's what I know. I think he's going there, and I'm sure in going to Tampa, before he made this decision, you know, that he let people know, listen, this is how I do business. This is how I do things. And I think at, at this point in his career, he's not looking or needing to do it for another 20 years right. or 10 years or probably not even five years, Mike. Let's be, let's be honest. What he's going to do is bring his work ethic See, and here's one of the unique things about Brady is it was not only his work ethic, but it was his work habits. So he's going to bring those things there. And here's what I do know about working in and around him. Um, If you're a young player or you're a veteran player, if you're an offensive player and you're not going to do the extra in terms of showing up early and working late, you're going to be dead to him. You know what I mean? You're, You're, hey, you know what? That's fine. That's who you are. That's who you want to be. Why don't you go over there? This is how the team is going to be. And he will rally the people 
you know, uh, around him. You know, one of the things we're seeing now, too, is all the players that allegedly now in the last 24 hours that want to go play in Tampa. Yeah, you think he's recruiting? Pl- do you see him recruiting players? Is he that? Would, I wouldn't have thought that that was his way, but I guess maybe he is quietly recruiting players. You know what? Here's what I think it is. I don't think he's actually picking up the phone and texting people. It's kind of like the Pied Piper. Right, they want you know, to show up. Yeah, yeah, people, yeah. But they just want to show up because yeah. they, want a, they want a piece of that. And that's one of the unique things about his personality, too, and just part of the the aura that surrounds Brady. And like I said, you know, my 27 years in the league, I have never been around a player like him. And I've been around some, some great ones. And I really don't think I'll ever be around another one like, uh, like Tommy because he has these unique elements of his personality to get people to follow where he balances, you know, he is extremely demanding, but he's also incredibly rewarding to those around him. So he clearly, I mean, you, I've seen it from what I mean. I saw, I saw Larry Bird do it. I saw him do it in person. His, I mean, he was mm. ferocious. I saw Michael Jordan do it. Brady must have been the same way, right? I mean, he would make sure that he got the point across if he didn't think somebody was doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? I mean, he made that very clear, right? Oh, loud and clear. Loud and clear. And it wasn't always in in an abusive way. It wasn't always in shiding someone. Again, he has this remarkable ability to read personalities and understand, you know, uh, people. And he he some people he would just wear out. Other people he would just... You know, he he didn't still a little bit of good old fashioned Catholic guilt in you, and but but he knew how he knew the the pressure points on different people, and um, he, for instance, I know a couple of high end draft picks that we had that and and other players that we had that showed up there that he was depending upon at at the skill positions, and he told them how it was going to be. And he would try to get them to work. And again, if they didn't work the way that they were supposed to, if they didn't show up early for meetings and and learn and and go through hand signals with him, if they didn't do all of the little things that it needed that needed to be done for not only them to be sex, successful together, but the team to be successful, he would try for a certain amount of time. And then if it didn't get done, he was done with you. Amazing. We're talking with Scott Pioli about, it, obviously, Belichick and Brady as uh, Tom Brady was taking a physical, I believe, either today or tomorrow in New York. They were going to set it up for him in New York to take the physical, and then he'd be a member of the Bucks, which is really, if you could think of a lot of teams, the Buck. I mean, I understand Arians, who uh, we both know, and he's a very good quarterback coach and a very good offensive coach. But, boy, Tampa is, a, is such an odd place for him to land. It really is. I mean, there, there there's other places you could have thought of that made sense sense, you know, and I don't know if Vrabel was a smoke screen or not. Uh, you would know better than I would, but uh, I, you know, there were places that it just seemed like they were more equipped to win, but I guess he thinks he can win anywhere. I mean, they, he, I mean, they have, they have players at the skill positions, there's no question. They don't, I mean, last year they were in a lot of shootouts, but I guess he feels, do you think he, do you think the roster was important to him, or do you think he just feels he can go anywhere and win? I, I no, I don't think he feels like he can go anywhere and win. Tommy is confident, but he's not arrogant, and he doesn't carry around an ignorant, an ignorant uh, type of hubris. So he's, I don't think he feels that way, Mike. I think what he he, I'm telling you this, the guy did a ton of research, and I'm sure he had people around him doing research. I'm sure he talked to Peyton Manning, and you know who spent who and, and a number of players that have played for and with Bruce Arians. I'm certain that he did his homework on that. I think he also did his homework in knowing who the roster, who's on the roster. Right. And I guarantee you this, one of the things I go back to the story when he would, when I was negotiating with Don Yee, one of the, his first big contract, when we did six years, $60 million, um, which at the time, you know, yeah. was a big deal, but it, but it wasn't, I don't even think that was a top five contract. He came in to my office, sat down, closed the door, and said to me, "Listen, Scott, I understand where you guys are at. I understand where you know you and Bill are at, where the crafts are at. He, you know where we're at." He said, "This isn't a negotiation, but I just need to know if I come to where you guys are, do you guys promise that you will take that extra money and keep players that we need to keep and give more money to others and or go out?" and spend more money on other really good players. I tell that story because I guarantee you 
that's what he was doing. Now, he won't come in and say, hey, I want player A, I want player B, I want player C. Again, he doesn't have that kind of arrogance. That's not that's not what he's looking to do in these things, Mike. He's just saying, listen, it's the whole just do your job mentality right here. I'm going to leave some money on the table. Just please promise me you're going to go out and do certain things to build this team. I'm not telling you who you need to get, but please make sure you surround me. And one of the things that the Bucks do have is a ton of cap space. Did you feel? Do you think he felt, Scott, that he was unappreciated? That it was not appreciated in, in New England at, at the end. Do you think? Do you think there's a sense I, of that? I never got that sense from him, Mike. I, I honestly, and, and I talked to him, and we stayed in touch, and then we stay in touch. But I never got the sense that he felt underappreciated because he really did get love from so many directions. And again. We all need love, right? And I get that. We all want to feel appreciated. He doesn't. He he doesn't need that to thrive in his life. And I think he got enough of that from the people around him. And again, he, he's just not that selfish where he needs so much of that that that's going to make his sunrise and sunset at the end of the day. You know, he's got a wing in 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 Canton. He doesn't have a, you know, he's got a, he's got a, he's got a city <laughs> block in Canton. We know that. He has nothing to prove. There's nothing he can do to elevate his status. I mean, because it's already there. What do you think still drives him? He competes against himself every single day, Mike. And and that's the thing, you're right. There's nothing else that he can do to separate himself even the records that he sent sets, he doesn't care about the records. He's just wanted the rings. He's a ring collector. He's a trophy collector. That's what he cares about. And then he also wants to, you know, be the best that he can be. But it's not just the football players. As a human being, it's it's his makeup. It's you know, as a father, as a husband, as a son. I've watched him with his parents, as a, as a brother. You know, I've watched those things. Everything that I've seen him do, he's tried to be the absolute best at it. You know, uh, I'll give you a quick story, Mike. Good. You know, it was it was March of 2001, and he hadn't hit the field yet, right? We had had him for a full year, and he was the down-the-line quarterback. You know, again, we kept him in 2000. What people don't realize is in 2000, we had four quarterbacks on the 53-man roster, and at a point in time, only had 51 players on the roster. So we knew we had something that we really wanted to develop in this player, and we thought he was capable. But in March of 2001, before he'd ever stepped on the field and played in regular season game, it's late March. I'm leaving the office on a Friday night, and you know we're doing draft prep. I'm leaving the office. It's late, and it's the old Foxborough Stadium. And I leave the stadium. I, I leave the offices, and I see that the lights are on in the bubble. And, and remember that old bubble that the sure. Patriots had yeah. that would collapse in the heavy snowstorm. Yep. Well, I saw that the lights are on, and so I go around the construction, and I go to you know make sure the lights are out and it was locked up. And I get there, and parked outside of the bubble is what we call the yellow Jeep. Brady had this god-awful yellow Jeep that he used to drive around as a rookie. He got a bad car deal from somebody. And I go in. And he's in there by himself, and he's got the elastic bands around his ankles, and he's doing footwork drills, throwing into the net, you know, that has the six pockets to throw the ball into. And he's doing footwork, listening to this old school boombox, throwing balls into the net by himself, 930 at night on a Friday night in March. It's, and it says everything. He, yeah, and I called him over. We had a quick conversation. I'm getting ready to leave. I turn around. I start to walk away. He goes, hey, Scott. And I turn around and look at him. He goes, hey, do me a favor. Don't tell anyone you saw me here tonight. And that's who he is. I mean, you, and, and I tell that story, Mike, because you ask a question, you know, what drives him? I don't know what drives him. The same thing that was driving him that night to be there on a Friday night is what's driving him today. He's chasing something that's internal. You know, it's funny, uh, the late Dick Rabin, who uh, obviously, uh, oh, yeah. you know, had a big hand evidently in, you know, pounding the table for him or whatever the, the, the saga goes. Yeah. Dr. O'Brien, who is uh, like family to me, did the physicals yeah. for the quarterbacks and said he was the worst bodied quarterback he'd ever <laughs> done in that that he'd ever seen in that in that draft. He was the worst physical specimen he'd ever seen at quarterback. And Doc was an old Harvard quarterback. And. 
all that, although Brady, you know, did play in at Michigan, obviously battled Henson that year for that last year. But uh, the the mm-hmm. bottom line is, um, I remember the year later that we were up in Saratoga and your father-in-law and I was sitting there and he said, the Pats love this kid at quarterback. And yeah. I said, you know, which kid? I thought, you mean the kid from Howard? You had a kid from Howard, I remember, at the time, right? Didn't you have a, you had a kid from Howard? I can't remember his name. I can't remember his name. Oh, it, yeah. it, was, um, it was the Juco Kent, uh, K-State transfer, right. Michael Bishop. Yeah, and I right. said, yes, no, he, he goes, no, no, not him. Not him, the other guy uh, from Michigan. I said, you mean Brady? He goes, yeah, he goes, you know, they really like this guy. And um, I'm like, well, you know, but what are they going to do? They have Bledsoe. So when you guys... Can you guys remember as a staff when you noticed there was something special about this guy or something different about this guy? Well, here's what it was. You know, we we liked the player when we when we drafted him because we saw a guy that was winning. It seemed like every time that Michigan won, he was playing and Henson was. He was the reason that they were winning games at Michigan. I actually, it, my last year at the Jets, I had a chance to see him play up at Syracuse. I was on the road doing a um, – a, uh, a an advanced scout of the Buffalo Bills, and I went to the Syracuse Michigan game that Brady played in, and he didn't do anything spectacular then. But as we watched more of the guy, you know, we thought, nah, interesting guy. But once we got him on campus, there was something about his personality. You know, he again, we had that 2000 season. We had four quarterbacks on the roster. It was it was Bledsoe, it was John Freeze, Michael Bishop, and Tom Brady. And again, at one point, we only had 51 guys on our 53-man roster. We just wanted to keep the winners around, the guys that we thought were in on the program. And this guy, as the number four quarterback, was unique. You know, he'd be around the building. He'd be sitting in running back meetings. He'd be sitting in receiver meetings. He would sit in his meetings, but whenever he had spare time, he was not only in, in those positional meetings, but he would work out with other position groups at different times just trying to cultivate relationships and there was just something different about him and and we 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 noticed it pretty darn quickly mike because again by the time you know september rolled around we were making sure that we were keeping this crazy fourth quarterback again who had you know i know i know steve o'brien well to dr o'brien um, you know, his son, Kyle, actually. Sure. But, uh, you guys um, groomed him into it now. Yeah. Kansas. Now he works for the Lions. Yeah. He started as yeah, a ball boy. Yeah. Play person. Yeah. yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. And, and and Steve is right. He's seen a lot of bodies. I've seen a lot of bodies in that with a bad body coming out. <laughs> and even that changed, right? I mean, even with hard oh, work, yeah. that changed, right? He changed his Absolutely. body. He changed the, I mean, the amount of work that this guy did. I mean, it's just really remarkable when you come from where he came from, which is obviously the saga of legends, you know, as he's become this, you know, uh, iconic and even iconic doesn't fit because we make too many people iconic. Now, if he's like, if he, exactly. he, he's on a different level, he's on that Jordan level. He's on that level that only the greatest of the great get to. I mean, that's where he is. He's a, he's on a very a level where there's not a lot of guys with him, uh, you know, where he's gone to. It, it really is. What is, the thing, and we're talking with Scott Pioli, who knows him so well. What is the thing you think he's proudest of, Scott? If the, is it is it just the number of wins? Is it the uh, is it the everyday wins? Is it the Super Bowl wins? I mean, what what is the thing that if you in his heart of hearts that you think he's proudest of? Knowing Tommy, I think it's his family. Quite honestly, I mean, I, I know everyone goes to the professional part, but I think it's his family, and that he's remained as as good a son, a sibling. Uh, husband and father, um, as he has close to his father, right? Very close to his oh, father, right? And his mother. Okay. Uh, I tell you what, it's um, it, it's uh, you know, I get emotional when I think about it, and knowing and hey, here's the other thing that people don't realize, you know, after the guy had won a Super Bowl and was a Super Bowl MVP, he's going into his third year in the NFL. He's Super Bowl MVP. He's still living in a condo with his two sisters. I mean, that's who he is. People again. There's these truths about Tom Brady that people don't understand how remarkable a human being he is. And, and I know the question you asked, Mike, what would be what he's most proud of? You know, when you talk to the guy, even when you're a close friend, the first thing he starts talking about is his family and how is your family doing. That's what he really cares about. Yeah, he, yeah, he's probably you know one of the greatest football players in the history of the game. Uh, you know, I, it's if not the greatest. Um, I always find it difficult to to 
measure or yeah, it's hard. Um, it's very hard. But in this era, there's no question. But, yeah, in this but, era. But, but you talk to the guy, and what he's most proud of is his family. You know, it's interesting, and, and everyone, and you would know this, Scott. I mean, because everyone knows that he had a uh, son with Bridget Moynihan, and that that yeah. he lives in New York, and he's uh, uh, and everyone. It was very plain to anyone who was reporting on this that. That was a big inf- that was a big influence in where he went was based on the fact that he needed to see his son Jack whenever he could or he needed to be close to him and he obviously lives in the east here in the, in New York I believe with his mom who's been on Blue Bloods for ten years uh, so uh, that's a big factor I guess for him too no doubt no doubt and being a good son is is paramount to him. You know, so so that could have been uh, it might have let a lot of teams out. You know, because everyone wondered about the West Coast versus the East Coast, but everyone seemed to feel that that was uh, maybe a major factor. Um, do you think? I mean, you look at it. You're a personnel guy. That's what you do. That's who mm-hmm. you are. You look at him and see slippage. You look at him and say he's got X number of years left. What do you look at when you look at the player you've watched all these years? I, you know, I don't look at it as an X number of years. What I do see is a player that doesn't do physically some of the things that he used to be able to do as well. But again, Mike, with you know, with crafty vets, um, crafty with a C, not a K, but vets who who they have something extra about them that allow them to be successful. Whether it's vision of the game, vision of the field, his accuracy, right? His accuracy is still rare. People used to knock him early on about his his arm strength. He certainly, you know, Mike, you step back. He can get it back. Yeah, he had a pass he threw in the Super Bowl that almost was connected. Oh. That pass was about 70 yeah. yards in the air. You know, that, yeah. that he almost hit Moss with was about 70 yards in the air. Yeah, and, and people always want to pick apart what players can of course. do and can't do. And of I'm course. just talking yeah. more broadly. You know, but when you look at this league and the 32 quarterbacks that are playing this league, would you say he's in the top half? Oh, heck yeah. Would you say he's in the top ten? If you stop and you look at the strengths and limitations of every quarterback in this league, is you know, is he at the elite level he once was? Heck no. And I don't think he would say that. But he knows that he's going to find a way to win games. And he can find a way to win games physically and mentally and through preparation. Let me ask you a couple of offshoots off that. Number one, for Belichick. We're talking with Scott Pioli, of course. Number one. Belichick's got Stidham there. Will he shop for a veteran? What do you think he does for a quarterback? What What would you expect well, from your mentor? I, I would. What I would expect for him to do is to turn over every rock, and he's probably even before this happened had a bunch of rocks turned over. He he's been anticipating that this right. would happen. He's already got a plan, is what you're saying. He's he, yes, he, he, exactly. Yeah, right. And that was just part of our culture up there. It's no different than it's no different than the culture that we had under Coach Parcell. Right. Too. They yeah, always they, have a plan. They always are prepared. Always, Absolutely. And, and know what the key, right? Because every and then everyone has a plan until you get hit in the face, as Mike Tyson said. Yep. But you know they were ready to be hit in the face too. So he's been working on this, and you know to speculate. I don't know what he's thinking. However, if I were there, I, I could see something like, you know, Jacoby Brissett is now, yep. you know, the backup. We thought of him. They, uh, yeah, he loves him. I know Parcells does too. Yeah, you know, father-in-law oh, always God. loved him. Oh, loves Bill, him. Loves the kid. Lo- absolutely worships him. Anyone even knew who the heck? The I know. Worships him. And not only that, has been a big <laughs> influence in his life too. A huge oh, influence huge. in his life. Yes, yeah, he worships yeah, the kid. Like, yeah. Just like he has with Teddy Bridgewater. Absolutely. I mean, that, that Absolutely. People don't know, people don't know that Bill has a handful of players. He basically oh. has not only – and takes no money from them, has basically yep. gotten them work, told them how to set up their contracts, made sure they save money and put it in the bank. What he's done with 100%. these kids is unbelievable. It really is. He's got yeah. a whole bunch of them that he does it with. You know, Mike, you're 100% right, and it's one of these things he doesn't tell people about. Nope. It. He doesn't let there be a story about it. He looks after these kids and some of these yep. uh, communities that are marginalized, and he looks after them, and he just wants them to see, wants to see them succeed. Tells them not but to buy a new go, car. Tells them to go, well, you know, you know how he is. You know, you know you, that's it. You don't need a new car. You don't need a new watch. You don't need any jewelry. Put the money in the bank. Blah blah blah. Yep. You know. Hey, he used to yell that to me too. He used to say that to me. <laughs> Yeah, but and and you know, so Jacoby is one of those guys that he's been mentoring since he's a high school kid, and um, but you know, 
to the point of the Patriots, I see him as a guy because I could see that. You know, a, I could see that. A he knows the culture, and yep. that's a big part of being a Patriot. Is the culture is not like 31 other teams in the NFL. It's overly demanding to some people, and there's a everything is demanding. But there's a different type of demanding under Bill Belichick, and Jacoby's a guy that a knows what it is and knows he wants to do it. And the Patriots, you know, Bill and Josh McDaniels know that he's a guy that could actually, you know, th- that could coexist with everyone there and be successful. I totally agree. I even tweeted that yesterday. I said, watch for him since he lost his job. Absolutely. Number two, you're a good personnel guy. Jameis Winston, mm-hmm. guy threw for 5,000 yards. He's th- he threw 30 touchdown passes. He also threw 30 interceptions. We know there's good and there's bad. As a personnel guy, does he look? Do you look at him as someone I can coach the negative out of him and win with him, or is he just too much mistake prone to touch? No, you know, Mike, I, and and I don't mean to be this heavy handed on him. I I don't. And the thing is, this is, you know, when we talk about quarterbacks, dependability is one of the most important things, if not the most important thing. And he has been undependable during his time in Tampa Bay. He was undependable during his time in college. And one of the things that's consistently happened is when he makes mistakes or runs into issues that are personal issues or on the field issues, there's never a mea culpa. There's never an ownership of, of his mistakes. And, and to me, Mike, one of the, what I saw this year, for instance, even after the 16th game this year, when they lost, he threw the pick sixes and he was confronted with the reality of the 30 in 30, yeah, 30, yeah. 30 club, and, and what a hot mess his season was. He was defiant in that moment, and even went so far. to It sounded somewhat delusional, and there was no ownership of the mistakes. And all of us make mistakes in life, Mike, but what we understand is that the only way to overcome mistakes is to own it, to humble ourselves, and then move forward. To me, I felt like Jameis Winston did did more damage by not acknowledging and owning his shortcomings than the actual physical shortcomings on the field. Interesting. A very, very good answer. Very, very, it just shows that there's an interesting way of looking at someone who clearly has talent, who obviously can't get the other part of the oh, job done. Yeah, the I mean, clearly, uh, no, no question about it. And we've seen so many of these quarterbacks move this year. Uh, are you surprised with – that the pat that you know he played great last year. You got to be fair. And I've never been a fan of his. Are you surprised with the emergence of Tannehill and how much Vrabel showed faith in him? I mean, he did play wonderfully for Tennessee. There's no question. They had a great running game and a great play action game. But he put up incredible numbers last year, and they clearly believe in him. Are you surprised he made that jump, or you're not surprised? I I was only marginally surprised because you know I thought he was a talented player coming out. I knew his college head coach. I spent time around, and I there, there was something I really liked about the player, but it just seemed like there was never enough consistency and/or stability around him. But you know, once he got to the NFL, and sometimes, you know, for players, in order for them to to develop, they need to have a good culture to develop in, and they have to have enough talent. It just seems like the sand was always shifting, and he never had enough consistency around him. One thing I know about Mike Rabel and John Robinson, their general manager, John and I worked together for a number of years too. That organization and that football program blocks out a lot of things and provides stability. So we had some stability. And the other thing I think they did a great job of that Rabel communicated with his offensive coordinator is this. Every player has strengths. Every player has limitations. What they did is they put him in a position to succeed and they really asked him to only do the things that he could do well and didn't put him in a position to fail. And I know that sounds very simple. No, it's important. No, it's impo- that's important, yeah. Just, exactly right. I mean, again, go back to Bill Parcells and part of what he did and what he taught Belichick. You know, when you get a young quarterback, what do you do, even if he has a big arm or not? You make sure – and they did this with Phil Sims, right? Have him get a couple of early – game, short completions, build his confidence, build the team's confidence. Heck, we did the same thing with Benny Testaverde. Yep. You know, when Dan Henning and... and you guys and, got a great... Uh, listen, you guys knew how to teach Benny Testaverde that no one else did. I mean, how to give him the game plan, how to make sure he could understand yeah. the game plan, and you got the best year out of him he ever had. I mean, he had a whole he had an MVP season. 
a couple of years. Yeah, yep. I mean, between Bill and you know Coach Parcells, between Ron Earhart, Charlie yep. Weiss, and then Dan, you know, they did the right things with him, and he listened. And uh, again, it's no different than so. That's what you need to do with players: is build their confidence and ask them to do things that they're capable of doing. Would you be? Would would we know that Tua has an incredible amount of physical talent? Would the injuries, how common they've been and how frequent they've been, would that scare you enough that you wouldn't draft him at the top? It would. It would concern me. It would. It wouldn't scare me off. It wouldn't scare me off because the other thing he has some. He has some of the other things, Mike, which are he has intelligence, he has escapability. He has accuracy, and he has remarkable leadership skills. He has rare leadership skills. Now, I would really want to hone in on this one particular injury, make sure that I had the baseline information that you got from Indy. But now in these days and times, it's going to be very difficult to get more. This is going to be a very interesting because we've got this other reality out here in this country with the the virus, know, the coronavirus, yeah. and yeah. the issues, which is going have. to be in every NFL um, contract now, too. I gather, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and and so to me, this is going to be a very interesting situation. You know, we've got much bigger problems than players, no question, physicals in the NFL, and yet this is going to be a particularly interesting player that you have to know a lot about physically and and medically before you can de- make a final determination on him. You you understand what's gone on with the Falcons in recent years, who have who should have already won a Super Bowl. Uh, they they threw oh, one, you're gonna bring that up to me, Mike? Threw one oh, away no. with both hands. <laughs> I mean, which is still mind boggling. But can you? They've been trying to patch rather than rebuild. Can they? Do they finally have to look themselves in the mirror and rebuild, or they, can they continue to patch? You know, Mike, it's it, it's going to be tough. You know, they, here's what they do have. They have a dynamic offense with some dynamic players, and they they made a fast run here last year and, and the year before in trying to, hey, we're close and go after a lot of players and, and, and build the team. But now they've had to dismantle it here a little bit, yep. you, know, you know, in the last couple of days. Let and a couple of key guys go, absolutely. Yeah, they, they, they really did. And it's going to take – you know, Mike, they're going to have to have terrific seasons. They've got a very wide gap like some other teams where they have a small number of players highly paid and then a number of other players that, you know, it's just this stark contrast. There's no real middle class. And the players that are getting paid the most have to step up and do a better job and play like the salaries that they're being paid, Mike. Yeah, and especially a couple of the big, big ones, obviously. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, listen, it's been a pleasure. Uh, again, uh, be safe. Take care of your family. Uh, we'll talk to you along the way. Are you going to stay on in my business now, or are you going to go back into football? No, right now I'm staying this. You know, Mia, as we talked about, Mike, Mia is a junior in high school, and I promised her, and Dallas and I have promised her we're not moving her. She's going to finish school here. So Has she picked so a college yet? To- she has it. She has it. I know where she's locked in on. I can't name the school, okay. but I know what she's locked in on and hoping for. But um, you know, she's ending the junior year, and then there's going to be a big push here with the with the boards and and try to get in. So, uh, but but I will say this, Mike: she's not looking at a school south of Providence, Rhode Island. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she's a northeaster through and through. <laughs> well, listen. Be well. Tell Dallas I said hello. I sure will. Thanks, okay, Mike, take care. Really My pleasure. It. Thank you. Scott Pioli, obviously, Pats, Falcons, uh, and uh, multiple-time NFL Executive of the Year. When we come back, we'll be joined on the fan. Mike's on. He's ready to go. On the fan. New York Sports Radio. Mike's on. Mike's on. Hit the fan at 6, brought to you by Casamigos Tequila, as always, brought to you by those who drink it on this first day of spring, which for the first time in 124 years is not on the 20th of March. It is on the 19th, first time since 1896, the vernal equinox, which is uh, what hits the uh, northern hemisphere and produces spring, is uh, early 
for some reason, I don't know exactly why it's early, but you know what? In this crazy year that you will remember forever, uh, we welcome you to spring. Uh, I always know the first day of spring is on my birthday, which is tomorrow, uh, which uh, is going to be one of the more unique birthdays I've ever had, obviously, as we all go through this crazy time. And what I want out of you this half hour is I want you to, uh, and I want to tell the guys in the control room right now, pop the phones up. And this is what I want from you guys. I want to get as many calls as I can in, and I want you to tell me what's going on out there. I want you to tell me whether you're in Westchester, whether you're on the BQE, whether you're in Brooklyn, whether you're in Staten Island, whether you're in Jersey, whether you're in uh, Connecticut, wherever you are right now, tell me what's going on. Tell me what I'm not seeing. Tell me what's going on. Tell me what you're experiencing. Uh, Because right now, which is always the case, right? We always have to be the best at everything. We always have to be first in the nation, first in the world at everything. And, of course, we have to be first in the world now at uh, having the most viruses, which we clearly do by a wide margin now as a state. Uh, There's over 3,000 confirmed uh, cases in the city. Uh, Westchester has been a epicenter from the beginning. Nassau is right there, so uh, great for Nassau County to be right there, too, and be one of the five or six most populated counties with viruses in the United States. So if you go down the list of counties in the United States with high levels of the virus, of course, it is all New York. So there we are, again, having to lead the nation in this. Hey, you would think California should be leading. They got the most people. but They're not. There are other states more populated than ours, but you know what? We have to lead the way, like always. So what else is new? And again, as I said, as I opened up the radio.com aisle before I talked to Scott Pioli about everything going on with the— and a great job by him. I hope you heard it talking about Brady and Belichick because, listen, he spent 17 years of his life as part of the Belichick Mafia— He and Mangini. And he was, I'm telling you, as close to Tom Brady, or as he calls him Tommy, as anybody could be. They are incredibly close and have been since Tom came into the league. So he knows more, and he's only going to tell you so much, but he gave you a very good inkling into what was going on and what is going on with Tom and with uh, the Patriots and with Brady and uh, with everything. Um I apologize. One of my lights, I've been having trouble with the lights here the last couple of days, so I apologize. One of our lights, my other light just went out. That's the second of the three lights that went out. That's why we didn't have video yesterday. I apologize uh, for that. So it just went out a second ago. We'll have to figure out what's going on with the lights here. But uh, the two of the three light stanchions that we used uh, to, for the video just went out uh, in the last day. So I got to get them fixed. But, you know, getting people in now to work and fix on this stuff is a little different than it normally is. So uh, that's the case. So we'll see why. The second light stanchion just went out. Uh, I don't know what's going on, but we'll let it be as it is for the rest of the show. Um, so get aboard. And this is what I want you to tell me. Just tell me what's going on. Are you going to work? Are you driving right now? If you're in your car, if you're home, wherever you are, if you've been to work today. I mean, just about everybody knows somebody who's tested positive. In the NFL, Sean Payton just tested positive. We've already had Kevin Durant test positive. You've already had multiple players on four different NBA teams test positive. Um, We all know people, whether the school had someone or you know someone already who has tested positive. Unfortunately, soon you're going to know somebody who's been sicker than you want them to be with this, and hopefully you don't know somebody who's in the hospital with this. But that's where we are right now. We are in a very delicate place, and I just really hope we're all taking it seriously. I mean, stay home. Just stay clear of everybody. Go out for a walk. Hit the golf course if you can do that. Just go out and take a a walk, take a jog, whatever, get out, get some fresh air, just stay away from people. I just saw these people lining up on the news, all congregating, getting books. What are you doing all jammed together like that? That's not what you're trying to do here right now. This doesn't work. We know someone at Fan who had it already. I mean, so, I mean, this is real. And I just don't get, and I... I keep coming back to it, and I don't want to keep hawking back to it, but I really just wish the powers that be would get it and realize that they just 
are moving way too slowly. Treat this like it treat it like it was an earthquake or it was a hurricane or it was a flood and you know you get the National Guard there and you get the boots on the ground and you get FEMA there and you go basically just get the troops there and get this handled on that level mobilize people mobilize people like you mobilize people when the power went off mobilize nurses from around the country, retired nurses, people who can work, doctors, get them and send them to the states that are going to need them and then move them to the states that you have to move them to. This has got to be done like it is a, like this is a, you know, a military campaign. It is. You're fighting a virus that is going to overrun us and we don't have four or five months to get back to work. It it's we're not going to make it at that rate. We got to get the country back running within six weeks. We have to by then have everybody tested. We have to have slowed the process here by slowing the obviously the uh, rate of how much we communicate this to each other, and we have got to get the healthy people back to work, get the other people home and in bed or home in the hospital, get them cared for. Hopefully we get something we can use for those that are extremely sick. We know today that there's been the malaria drug that's being used on people who are very ill, the arthritis drug that is being used, and there's another Japanese drug that a doctor friend of mine sent over today that's being used also that has been working over in the Far East and is working. It was a drug that was also created for something else but is working on these cases, on those that are in the hospital. So if we can take away the equation or at least the threat of people getting very sick or dying, and take that fear away, that will be the first layer. The second layer is to get everybody tested. No, the numbers are not going to be good when we get everybody tested. They're going to be really bad. But it'll be a step in the right direction where we can get the people home who need to be home. And even in your home, you know, if you got someone who's sick, keep them in their bedroom and keep them away from everybody else. Just common sense. And if you get it, don't panic. And then if you get sick, then get to your doctor and get a test and get yourself care. You know if you need care or not. You know if you're really sick or not. I mean, if you got a, you know, a runny nose, come on. If you got 103 temperature, we'll do something. But I just don't get the idea. I mean, Congress, the Senate went home for a couple of days before they put that bill in motion. What are they kidding Are you serious? I mean, they should, the military should have been called up. What are they doing? Are they busy? Are they fighting some war I don't know about? Fight this one. Get the National Guard in, whether they're dispensing tests, setting up test lines, cleaning hospitals, whatever it is. And I feel for the people in the hospitals who are working overtime because, you know what, we need those people. And you know what? We can't do enough for them. Pay them all double time. I don't care what we do for them. Promise them extra vacation, whatever they need. Because the doctors and the nurses, you know what? We need them now. We need their expertise. But we need people to realize that the clock is running. We should say, hey, we are going to get a test to everybody by this date. We are going to get everybody tested by this date, and we're going to get back to work by this date. And that's the way it should be done. And I don't get the sense of urgency at all. I really don't. And every day, you know, I don't want to see that. I just turn it on every day and see the number goes up by two or 3,000 in our city, no less than what it goes up in the country. And I don't want to hear about someone I know is in the hospital or someone I know is dying with this thing. In our country, people shouldn't die from this. I'm sorry. Our hospitals, our doctors, our medicine is too good. And 
and let's get moving before these hospitals get overrun. Everyone keeps telling you every day, if you're listening to the governor, he's telling you before long, these hospitals are going to get overrun. And he's been ahead of the curve on this from the beginning. Whether you like him or not, he's been ahead of the curve on this. You can't knock the job he's done. He's done a good job. From what I've seen, he's done a good job. And I don't always agree with Andrew, but he's done a good job here. He really has. Got to be fair. I call it the way you see it. I think in Washington, they've been dragging their feet. I think they got to move quicker. Unless they know something I don't. If they do, tell us what it is, because all I see is the numbers multiplying by the day. And we can't bail out every con- we can't bail out every single business in this country and every single uh, company in this country. We don't have that kind of money. People complain when we bailed out the banks, we bailed out the oil industry, which was the right move. It turned out to be a very, very positive move at the time. It was you know what? Not everybody agreed with it, but it was dead on. The bail out the banks was the right decision too. And thankfully, the banks don't need, don't need being bailed out right now. They're strong. They don't like where the interest rates are. But our rally today, I don't think, had anything to do with, on Wall Street, did not have anything to do with the idea that things are getting better. I think this was the, was the case that we saw the pressures ease on the credit markets because the oil went up. Because that oil has been putting a lot of pressure because they don't want those companies going belly up. And they're borrowing, they, they, they owe a lot of money. So that the oil price went up, I think, was the reason why. Because I haven't seen anything yet that tells me we're turning a corner. I'll be thrilled the day we do. And then we can get back to thinking about sports. And yeah, we miss it. We all miss it. We would have been in the middle of the NCAA tournament right now. I mean, think about it. Be getting ready for the night session. Be getting ready for, you know, eight more games right now. First day of the tournament. This would have been great. We've been talking about, can you believe somebody, blah, 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 today. That's why I was trying to get Jay on. I'll try and get him tomorrow because I thought of what's Jay doing tonight when he should have been in the NCAA tournament. But I didn't contact him early enough, so I didn't get him yet today. I didn't find him. But I'll try and get him for tomorrow. And just see what he's doing with a team that you know that has been a staple for the tournament. I'll get a quick break, then we'll see how many calls we can get in. And just tell me what's going on. You know, I want you to be my uh, reporters out there. And just tell me what you're seeing, what's going on, what you're experiencing, so I get a feel for it. Because I need you to tell me. Back after this. I'm the hour, so... Tell me what's going on. Uh, as you hear, you just heard that, that update on how many cases we have now and how many are growing. By the, I mean, every day it's another 1,000 people in, in the state of New York. So, I mean, it, the number keep going up and up and up and up. So we're right in the middle of it, as always, aren't we always? Stephen Holmdel, what's up, Steve? How you doing, Mike? Good. Tell me what's going uh, on. I'll, I'll give it to you as a physician's perspective. I'm a physician in Monmouth County. What kind of physician? A general guy? Or what, a, what kind? A gastroenterologist. A gastroenterologist. Okay. Go ahead, doctor. Not too far from your old stomping grounds in uh, Barre and okay. Belmar. Go ahead. So from the standpoint, real quick, of medicine, uh, you know, office hours have completely dwindled lately. Patient, very few patients coming into the office. Right. Very few procedures as outpatients in the hospital. Right. But now we have nurses in the hospital that have tested positive. Partners in my group have been exposed, and now they're being tested and can't work until they're cleared. What so can you do, actually- Doc? What, what is a guy who's a, who has a specialty like you, what do you do now if you're not allowed to do elective surgery? Well, uh, we still have to cover emergencies in the hospital, okay. so okay. obviously okay. Uh, they've taken precautions within the hospital system, but outpatient elective Procedures, most of which are done at surgery centers, are uh, it's practically nil at this point. What do you think and, about uh, the idea, Doc, what, uh, that they say that they now believe these other drugs that were used on malaria or arthritis are doing uh, some good things with people who are very ill? Do you buy into that? Well, it's hard to say that's out of my, my realm of expertise. Obviously, that would be phenomenal if somehow you can treat it. But, uh, you know, obviously, right now, the main thing is just, to, like you said, isolate the people that have it. And uh, obviously, the most practical thing is just to try to uh, screen everybody and just separate everybody out. How sick do you but, think uh, somebody has to be before they should be concerned? Um. Well, 
obviously the, the things you mentioned, sore throat and fever, I think any little warning sign, you wouldn't, you shouldn't wait till you're on death's door, obviously. I think that if you have flu-like symptoms, you just have to isolate yourself and not go to the ER, because going to the ER is really not going to, unless, unless you can derive treatment, which right now isn't readily available, uh, just stay at home and not expose other people to your, uh, to your illness. Thank you, Doc. Be well. Ike in Brooklyn. Thank what's you, up, Mike? Ike? Thank you, Doc. Uh, what's up, Ike? How you doing, Mike? Good, Ike. What's up? Well, I'm a salesman, and uh, I'm continuing to work on a limited basis. I drive, and I go to stores. I was in the city today, coming from Brooklyn. The traffic is like a Sunday morning, basically. It, it's nil. Very, the traffic, very traffic, quiet. traffic, nil. Are, very, are the stores? Very quiet. Are the st- what, what kind of product do you sell? I sell domestic linens, so it's not food. The, right. food, the supermarkets are jam packed. The right. stores have some people in them, but obviously it's the, the, the traffic is, is very down and the businesses are really off and stuff like that. I have a daughter in law that's a PA. She has no experience with treating this, but she's volunteered and she's in NYU hospital and she's decided that she's going to help. And, Good for you know, her. They show you, they show you her, her. She has a gown, she has a mask, and then she has like a plastic over the mask. And we wish her the best. She's, Good for uh, her. She's That's very nice really of her. unbelievable. Thank you. Yeah, one fun... One... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, we lost them. I apologize. Apologize for that. Uh, Matt in Manhattan. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, hey. Uh, my, my, my experience with this started about 10 days ago. One of my wife's friends tested positive for it. My wife is in a high-risk category. She absolutely cannot get this. It could potentially kill her. So for the last 10 days, we've been in complete lockdown mode. I work from home. I, thankfully, I, I work for a company that allows that. I go out once a night. One, I leave the apartment once a day, about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. I go out for exercise. I do a lap around Central Park. I go to a store to buy food. I take the food home. I wash off every single container with soap and water, and then I don't leave the house until the next day. Has your Everybody wife been out at all? Has she been out? I, I t- look, you know, look, she can go out in the evening. I take her out. As right. long as nobody is around, it's okay. But honestly, from what I know about this, and I know a lot now because, because it's been such a huge concern for me, right. if everybody is not doing something similar to what I'm doing, the shutdown does not work, and we can't have the shutdown in vain. It's going to destroy the economy. People I agree. People have to observe this. They, listen, they have, to, they have to take this seriously. They have to do it. We have to do it, get everybody tested, and get this done and get back to a normal life because in three or four months, we won't have an economy. We really and won't. The problem, is that, the problem is that I saw a poll today that 58% of Americans right now have not changed their daily routine That's ridiculous. They, you that. know what? That, we shouldn't allow that anymore. So the idea that, that – that, that, and you're right, uh, and thanks for the call. The idea that there's 50% of the people out there who think they can live normally, I mean, come on. You know what? You're going to regret it in three or four weeks. You really are. You really are. I mean, this has got to be something where you've got to take it seriously. This is, not, this is not like any other time. This is not like anything we've ever dealt with before, and we have a chance here where if we don't handle this right, not only are we going to lose people, but we will not even recognize what our country looks like in two months. Really, two months would be too long for us to be in this kind of mode. We need to get back to work, and we need to get the people separated. The people who need to be home need to be home. The people who need to be in the hospital need to be in the hospital, and we need to get the other people back to work and back to school. And if we can't get to school by, for summer, I can live with that. Everyone wants to be on video. I've seen my kids do it. They can do that for the rest of the year. That's not going to kill anybody. But we need to get back to work. Uh, and use the merchants in your neighborhood because they need the business. They really do. Buddy and Shirley, what's up, buddy? Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Good, buddy. What's up? Um, I'm in corporate investigations in Manhattan, and I commute every day out to the LI, on the LIE to uh, exit 6. Out in Shirley, and I'm telling you right now, usually takes me two and a half hours each way to go in and out of Manhattan, and it's taken me about 45 minutes to get home. My wife's in uh, corporate banking out here, and they're actually advising her that under no circumstances are they going to be closing the banks out here, and they're forcing their employees to go to work. Is that true? Yeah, uh, I mean, you know what these okay. listen, these banks have got to take and everybody's got to take this seriously. You, I mean, you got you, I, you have to we, you see. I actually agree. And, and thanks for the call, buddy. But I actually agree that we should take radical, radical, a radical approach for the next 15 to 17 days where we shut down everything. It, we've almost shut it down anyway. We've shut down our economy. We've shut down our, all our sports. Shut everybody down except if they have by necessity to go out. 
Shut it down like you're in for a snowstorm for 17 days. Let's get tests to every nook and cranny of this country. Find out and isolate those that are sick in the next three weeks. And then within a month, we can get back to work. To do it piecemeal is going to be so destructive to our nation. We are not going to come out of this. And if you think the government's going to bail out every person and every company in this country, it's not going to happen. They don't have the ability to do that. Matt Lincroft, what's up, Matt? Is Matt there or no? Yeah, Matt, go ahead. Hey, Mike. Yes. Hey, um, I'm on a construction site and it's business as usual. That's in, God, it, it, God. Are you are you guys? Why? why are you, and you're all working just like normal. Just like normal, Mike. All around, like nothing changed. Well, Through the why? rain, every Mike. I don't. You know, I don't. Guys, you know they want you. You want to stick on jobs. You don't ask questions. You just go in. I understand, but, you, but what are you working on? A home, a, a building? What are you working on? No, like a, like a state and county job on a road. Well, you know what? If you're doing something that they is is for the public good and you need to be out there, and the and the government sends you out there, I understand that. But if you're out there doing stuff that can wait a month, they better. And I don't care if you're talking about municipalities, guys who are doing construction. Everybody better realize they better send their employees home, and they better take this seriously, or they're not going to have an economy in two months. They're really not. This is not going to yeah. work. If th- these numbers are going up by the thousands every day, this is not, and we haven't even tested anybody yet. This is going to get insane. And the idea that some people will do it and some people don't do it. I mean, and I understand you're told to go to work, you go to work. It's got to be above you. It's got to be the guy who's in charge. The people who are in charge, they have to be told by the, by the government, the police, the national guard should be out there saying, no, no. Shut the site down. Shut it down. Shut the whole thing down. Hey, Cuomo said today 75% of workers have to be sent home. Well, then, you, then he shouldn't be allowed to let people all be at one site. That's all there is to it because it can't work that way. You're going to spread this thing like wildfire. And if half of us are doing it or 30% of us are doing it, the rest of us have to do it. I'm doing it because I don't want my kids to get sick. I don't want I don't want anybody to get sick. I don't want somebody I know to get sick. I don't want somebody who's older to get sick. I don't want anybody to get sick. I don't want people who have conditions to get sick. I mean, I don't want to see any of this. We all have to take this seriously. I mean, it's imperative that we take this seriously. I promise I'll do this again tomorrow night. I wish I had more time to do it. I promise I will do it again. But listen, folks. And if you're an employer out there, use your noodle. You know what? If you piecemeal this, you remember that I said this. If you piecemeal this now and you try to get your building built right now, or you try to think you're the one who can go to work and have all your employees there, in a month when this thing is out of control and we are out of work and this economy stops for three or four months and your company goes out of business, remember I told you that. Because right now, we need to shut it down for, th- for two to three weeks, get everybody tested that we can get tested, get people isolated, and then get back to work. And we can't go back to work in this country until we have tested a majority of the people in this country, which will take at least a couple of weeks, a majority of the people in this country, and that we see the numbers going down. And as it gets warmer, hopefully that will start to kill the virus. But we're not going to get real heat in most of this country for a couple of more months. You know, we're still 60 days away from it being really warm. And maybe it'll dissipate over the summer, but we got to be realistic about this. We've got to take it seriously. And it's up to the government to make sure everybody does and to take it seriously themselves and really stop patting themselves on the back so much. Too much of that going on for what's going on because I don't think the progress is being made as as quickly as it needs to be made. Steve Summers is next. We'll see you tomorrow.